ông cứ chọc ông chúng mình ra bắc cạn mình to cái tầm đại ca này thì sạm đại ca hay là đó là việt ca chuyển từ cầm việt bì cà phê đầy lục nguyên chí đã đảm bày miền bắc cạn bắn to cả tăng tầm lô đỉnh đầu chụp buộc nó sẽ xây steel header Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good morning again, Mr. Hedder. Um, right now, I would like to turn the topic of the methodology of your writings and your academic publications. Before I come to that specific topic, I would like to ask you a, a, a question with respect to uh, the answers that you have been giving today and the previous days. From your testimony, um, it is clear that you did extensive academic scholarly research in the 80s and the 90s. In, in 2006, you started working for the Office of the Investigating Judges and were detached for a while to prosecution. Afterwards, uh, when you left, uh, you continued writing at least some publications in respect of uh, politics in Cambodia, sometimes making references to uh, the DK period. My question to you is, um, when you were giving the answers to the questions of the prosecution, um, and when you were asked to, um, to give evidence as to whether sources were confirmed by other sources, etc., were you able to uh, distinguish between the knowledge that you have gathered in your scholarly periods and when you were working uh, as an investigator. Um, generally speaking, I think, yes, I certainly tried to do so. Um, of course, realistically speaking, um, I don't have even the beginnings of a case map, much less a Xilab in my head. Um, so it's not always possible for me to be absolutely certain that I can segregate in my own mind what knowledge came to me when via what channel was the result of what work. Um, but I've tried to, I'm, I'm aware of this distinction. I've tried to segregate to the best of my memory and the best of my mental capacities out the various parts of the, the knowledge and, and the provenance thereof. Then are you saying that the answers that you have been given in the past days are based on your knowledge? gathered in respect of your academic publications and not so much as to what you have learned through the investigations? Um, I can tell you that um, I have been that's what I've attempted to do. And with regard to the period that the Khmer Rouge were in power, um, I mean, I think it might be useful to, to, to go through that. I mean, I did, obviously, I did some work on the Khmer Rouge before they were in power when I was in Cambodia in 73, 75. Uh, and I've indicated that I attempted to look at policy structure and organization, um, both as it related to the situation between 73 and 75 and as it related to the origins of the movement. That was the archive rat in the National Library in Cambodia and also some field uh, uh, interviews. Um, I followed the Khmer Rouge in power to the extent that I could, the limited extent that I could while I was at Cornell. Um, and then um, after that, um, in a series of 
capacities. I look both at the post Khmer period and the Khmer period itself. And I tried to you know, focus on the parts of my work that relate specifically to the Khmer region in power, so the delimited by what I understand to be the temporal jurisdiction of, of the court. Um, and we have kind of a reversal of the situation I face now. There was a time after January of 79 where everybody was interested in what was happening after January of 79. Uh, I had to kind of make time to look at Khmer Rouge. Now I've reached a situation where I've tried to reverse that. One, one last question on this uh, topic. I know it's a difficult question, but um, are you able to make a distinction in the sense of your post-investigation academic articles and your pre-investigation academic articles in the sense that you maybe not have changed your mind uh, academically in respect of the DK period 75 um, If memory serves, there's only one piece of writing that's come out about uh, Khmer Rouge policy since I left the employ of, U of UNHKRT, uh, to be precise, which was in April, May 2011, that I left, um, And there's one piece of work that relates to Khmer Rouge policy, not practice so much, but policy that came out later, uh, based primarily on revolutionary flags like stroke youth, based on the ones that were already in my possession, either in original form or in photocopy form before the tribunal started, um, plus some in-court, open-court testimony. And in that, I tried to elaborate on some of the themes that I um, put forward in the paper at the, before the German Historical Society, which later led to the summarized, shortened version that was an academic publication under the general rubric, senior leaders and local authorities. And in that regard, if you're talking about my thinking, I think the crucial turning point is my stance as a uh, fellow, research fellow, uh, at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in Washington, which is a part of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I sort of went there, that's late 2000 and one to early 2002, if I recall correctly, after 9-11, whenever that was. Um, and I went there with this notion in my head based on my previous interviews, including the ones I did in the 80s, um, of there being a, a, a significant amount of local initiative, local deviation, local power in the overall picture. Um, and I sort of went there with some to the, to the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, which is sort of, one of the, maybe the highest level place for studying the Holocaust, um, with some trepidation, fearing that I would go there and see myself seen, as I put it in my worried head, uh, as the David Irving of Khmer Rougeology. That is to say, someone who was putting themselves effectively in the position of uh, what some would, uh, would, would say is Holocaust denial of a sort. Um, only to discover that the way in which I had come to understand the Khmer Rouge regime based on my previous work was pretty much in line with at least one major part of uh, Holocaust studies, which precisely puts an emphasis on local initiative, local deviation, local power as opposed to the old 
the model of totalitarian control, uh, a model which in academic circles has pretty much long since been seen as discredited and discarded as a way of looking at how these kinds of regimes operate. No, I, I take it from your answer that that particular um, uh, academic stance has maybe also led to the article uh, reassessing uh, the role. But if I make it more general, more, more broad in terms of your post-investigation thinking and your pre-investigation thinking and scholarly publications, um, what would be, if any, the big difference between your post-investigation scholarly publications and your pre-investigation uh, Um, I'll answer the question maybe slightly not head-on. Um, I think that it's the case that the views that I had, the empirical views, if you will, the factual views that I had come to before I went to the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, and for which my time at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies provided a kind of general theoretical framework, one which I discovered, as I said, was very much in line with one major school of thought understanding of the Holocaust. Um, those views, empirical and analytical, if you will, witness and expert, if you will, um, were not in any way significantly changed by the evidence, documentary, or in terms of pre-witness, witness testimony uh, as a result of my interaction with my employment by UNAKRT uh, to assist the So again, I think the major turning point occurred, the major turning point in my thinking occurs before the court is established. Um, it's not changed as a result of my employment either full-time or as a part-time consultant. If that was employment, I guess that was employment. It's salary, not funding. It's an employee, not a grantee. Uh, wasn't changed by, by my court experience, nor by the little bit of additional field research that I did after, in the latter part of 2011, after I left the court, but before I decided I was done for now with research on the Khmer so to summarize and to take a different angle on this, and that will be my last question on it, the things that you wrote in seven candidates for prosecution, and its sources that is still also after the investigation, your view of what happened in the DK period, more roles of the two accused. Is that correct? Oui, Monsieur le Président, à ce stade, je voudrais faire une objection. J'aurais pu d'ailleurs la faire aussi sur les questions précédentes. Je crois que demander à une personne comment sa pensée a évolué, comment ses opinions ont évolué, comment ses analyses se sont transformées, c'est poser des questions à un expert et non pas poser des questions à un témoin. Mon confrère a été très attentif pour que nous ne dépassions pas cette limite du côté de la barre, et ça n'a pas été très facile. Je pense qu'il est en train de la dépasser largement. Il pose des questions à un expert en lui demandant de définir sa pensée et l'évolution de sa pensée au fil des années. Je fais donc une objection. Merci. Merci. 
his thoughts leading to academic articles and publications before. We have been asking this witness all along about his uh, academic publications, so it would be perfectly within the realm of Mr. Heather here being a witness to ask this specific question. I'm not asking about an informant to me. I'm asking about the development within himself, so to speak, in respect of um, the DK period. Mr. Heather, I'm going to ask you a question. បាទតែខ្ញុំតោះនឹងសម្ហាងហេតុនេះទៅខ្ញុំតោះរបស់មេត្តាវីនោះមុខកម្លាំងដើមដឹងរាប់ពីនេះចំពោះរបៀបតា
personal or individual, uh, personal or a documentary knowledge. Um, but it's only a part of the picture. It's a matter of emphasis or research focus. Um, so I would describe seven candidates as less complete than what's in reassessing, but not uh, at all entirely antithetical. There might be some, if I re, re, redrafted, recirculated, and republished it now, there are probably some qualifications, changes that could be considered qualifications that I might make, but it would be more one day uh, once all of this is over and everything is available, um, a matter of re situating some of, those, some of that evidence, or some of that data, some of that material, um, rather than um, changing it. I would love to have a longer conversation with you, Mr. Heder, but I have to move on because of time constraints, and that is going to the methodology used in your academic publications and uh, books, etc., that we have been asking so many questions to you about. Um, and by way of introduction, in, uh, in respect of the used methodology, let me um, just quickly, for time's sake, quote a few uh, comments that you have made in respect of the methodology used by uh, Ben Keenan in his book uh, on Pol Pot. Uh, and, um, just to, 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 to give a, a very quick selection, uh, uh, I have written down that you are saying that Keenan sometimes uses false evidence, uses selectively documents, uh, has come to baseless conclusions, is sometimes misleading, is sometimes wrong, is sometimes inconclusive, and is sometimes using stereotypes. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, present the ERN numbers uh, um, for the prosecution, so the prosecution can uh, confirm that I have, in fact, um, summarized it well. When it comes to false evidence, it is ERN 773. Um, the selective use of documents would be ERN 773744. The basis conclusions would be ERN 773724 or 773747. The misleading in respect of the charm would be ERN 773726 and the ERN 773732. Where Keenan is wrong, fundamentally wrong, that would be ERN 773736. Where Keenan is inconclusive, inc that would be 773764. And where he is using stereotypes, that is on that same ERN number. All, all of them? But I'm happy to make some local chair to be late on Salamis for my name, or Prakisa and Tonte, to be some local chair. I can say they look, look, I mean, I'm wrong, 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 I'm Mr. President, I, I hope it might save time because my objection is actually to relevance. Uh, how is it relevant for you to receive Mr. Hedder's opinion on Mr. Kiernan's methodology? It's wholly irrelevant. 
So my objection isn't just to e-numbers. This line of questioning is wholly irrelevant. By all means, ask Mr. Hedder about his methodology, which I've already covered at length, and I hope there wouldn't be unnecessary repetition. But you're not going to be assisted by receiving Mr. Hedder's opinion on Mr. Kiernan's methodology. And it's for that reason that I object. Um, Mr. President, I was trying to save time. Uh, Oui, Monsieur le Président, je souscris à l'objection, Monsieur le Procureur. Ça, c'est la première chose. La deuxième chose, c'est une remarque à propos de la façon dont mon confrère cite les documents qu'il souhaite utiliser. Nous n'avons jamais la référence du document. D'abord, nous ne savons pas, nous ne pouvons pas vérifier si ce document est versé ou non. Donc, c'est la première chose à donner, c'est la référence du document. Concernant ensuite les ERN, nous nous plions tous ici à cette exercice fastidieux de donner les ERN en trois langues, mais la défense de Nunchea estime qu'elle est au-dessus de cela. J'aimerais qu'elle respecte aussi cette obligation, par respect pour nous et pour nous faciliter la tâche. Merci. Uh, slowly, and it's, uh, I'm referring to an uh, E131 slash 1 13.3. It's Steve Hedda's article called Racism, Marxism, Labeling and Genocide uh, in Ben Keenan's The Pol Pot Regime. We have extensively been discussing this uh, article already earlier. Um, I will give you the ERN numbers, English ones again, together with the um, French and Khmer ones. Um, Kiernan sometimes uses false evidence. That is ERN 773-753. French ERN 00802825, Khmer 00844590080. The selective use of documents, um, that is ER, English ERN 773-744. French ERN. Barang. 0080821 the baseless conclusions ERN 773 French 0080821 Misleading ERN 773 French 0080821 is fundamentally wrong would be ERN 773-756, French 0080-802-816, up until 0080-02817, inconclusive would be ERN English 773-764, in French, that would be 0080 2830 I'm using, and that's why I think it's relevant, uh, as an introduction to the methodology of uh, used by this witness to um, <coughs> Je 
Je veux simplement faire remarquer qu'une fois de plus, les références sont données tellement rapidement que l'interprète en français n'a pas pu nous les donner toutes. Je fais simplement remarquer, je ne vais pas demander que mon confrère répète, mais j'aimerais qu'à l'avenir, il respecte au moins notre droit de savoir de quoi il parle. ហើយបាទអរណាហើយកាកតកងកលនេះសំត្រប់ហើយសូមលោកមេត្តវីបញ្ជាក់នៅលេខឯកសារនៅលេខអនុច្បាស់ហើយជួតយុតដើម្បី
two. Um, and I was fairly confident on the basis of my previous research that that was incorrect. But in fact, the person widely known within party circles as brother number two was your client. Um, so in the context of um, Yung Suri's purported leadership of a breakaway um, Khmer Rouge elements or PDK elements, um, it was widely reported on the basis of the assertions by Ben Kiernan and others that brother number two had emerged. Um, and I had said to a number of people that I didn't think that Yang Suri was brother number two. I thought that Nguyen Chia was brother number two. Um, and I think Yang Suri, to a certain extent, wanted to use this interview as an opportunity to um, attempt to confirm that I was right in my conclusion that it wasn't him, but Nguyen Chia, who was brother number two. Um, and certainly, um, this, what he said, you know, seems to confirm that position. Um, so yes, I mean, I think he had an interest in, um, in contributing to the refutation of the, to my mind, even before the interview and certainly ever since, uh, the, the notion now, which I think everybody has dropped, at least in the scholarly community, don't know about in here, uh, this notion that Yim Suri was brother number two. So if, if that's what you're after, I think that's probably correct, yes. Maybe also in more general terms, um, Philip Short has written in his book that he, that, that, that he is devious and, man and manipulative. Um, when you interviewed Ing Sari, was that something you could hear in his answers as well, or were you, before you went into that interview, cautious about his alleged uh, manipulative personality? Um, I mean, I think the broader answer is he, like almost virtually every last one of the other former CPK um, cadre, that is, persons in a position of at least some authority, to whom I have spoken over now many, too many decades, um, seem to be at pains to try to convince me that they themselves were not responsible for all the terrible things that some, but not all, but most admitted uh, had happened. So it was, has rarely, if ever, very, very rarely, if ever been the case that somebody admitted direct responsibility for what in their mind was direct responsibility for what happened. And I think and I, this is the same experience that, I, I, if I recall correctly, has been recounted by Chang Yuk and others from DC camp. Um, so in that sense, again, like almost everybody else, uh, he seemed to be at pains to try and convince me, persuade me, um, that he was not responsible for those matters, or at least not directly responsible. Not directly responsible in the layman's sense that a scholar and not necessarily an international criminal lawyer would understand it. That's a separate issue. This wasn't a courtroom. He wasn't represented. I wasn't, didn't have counsel present either. So this was uh, a conversation on a different level. More concretely, would you be able to, to say after the conversation that you had with Ng uh, in 96, um, which parts um, are truthful and which parts are not truthful, or rather which parts are um, uh, which parts of the interview are confirmed by other sources that you have approached and talked to. 
Mr. President, I let um, I let the last question run, but certainly not this one. Um, it's an impossible task for Mr. Hedder, even with a witness hat on. It's an impossible task for him to determine during which parts of the interview Ing Suri was telling the truth and which parts he may not have been and for what reason. Whether Ing Suri was telling the truth in this interview is an entirely a matter for the trial chamber, and it's not something which Mr. Hedder can properly be asked, nor should be asked to give an answer upon, and I object. Um, my learned friend is, the, I think, making a mistake in, uh, in the interpretation of the word truth. Obviously, there is a um, trial truth, a legal truth, so to speak. But any witness um, in any normal conversation will be able to make an assessment based on his human nature and the human nature of the other person that he's interacting with, whether this person is telling the truth, yes or no. So that's it's not a question as to the legal truth, it's a question as to uh, the truth in the sense how it came out in the demeanor of Ing Suri at the time. But not only this, I was also asking uh, the witness if the things that Ing Suri had said in that interview were somehow confirmed by other sources um, that the witness has been speaking to or had been reading. So I think it's a perfectly legitimate question to a specific witness in respect of an interview that he had. បាទរយៈចំពោះនឹងសម្ហាងហេតុនៃសេចក្តីចំពោះរបស់ដំណាងសហភាពញ៉ាចំពោះសំណួរចុងក្រោយដែលសួរឡើងដោយមេត្តា
might otherwise be. Um, and in the real world, um, you know, scholars and uh, legal practitioners are like face this problem and we all face this problem. Um, and if I might be allowed, uh, the reality is that from a comparative perspective, comparative political science perspective, comparative historian's perspective, the data, be it evidence or not, be it deemed probative or not, that we have with regard to the Khmer Rouge regime is less quantitatively and qualitatively less good than that which we have for Soviet, the former Soviet Union, for Nazi Germany, even arguably for China and Vietnam. Uh, so yes, these, these gaps, these absences are a significant problem uh, with regard to drawing conclusions, historical, political, scientific, or otherwise, with regard to what really happened and how it happened and why it happened uh, under that particular regime. Um, in your work, Mr. Heather, in your publications, um, sometimes you're only referring to um, the publication of one writer, um, sometimes Poncho, for instance, sometimes um, Donald Kirk, some, sometimes somebody else. Um, now would you be able to, to, to tell us how you went about in the selection of specific books or articles in general terms when it comes to your publications? Well, in part, this answer is a subset of my answer to the previous question. Um, as a Khmer Rougeologist, um, going to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, going to the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, um, and seeing what they had in terms of secondary materials, and now we're talking about secondary materials, um, in their um, center library, certainly would make one want to cry, uh, because in terms of the richness of the secondary literature, uh, the situation is, the, the contrast I, is, if anything, even more stark. Um, what, what happened in Nazi Germany, what happened in the Soviet Union, what happened in Mao's China, what happened at least during the revolutionary struggle, if you accept that terminology, in Vietnam in the 60s, um, has been written about much more than what happened in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. Um, so there's a lot more to choose from. Um, in those other instances than there is in this instance. And I guess in terms of choosing sources for working on the Khmer Rouge, um, my bias would be in favor of those who, in some sense, to my mind, were on the ground. Um, you know, the more time they spent in Cambodia, the more people they talked to while they were in Cambodia, the greater the effort they made to get out of Phnom Penh, um, and the like, the more generally likely I was, I suppose, to feel that their secondary writings, these secondary sources were worth consulting and uh, citing. Let me follow up on that, uh, Mr. Heather, and giving you an example of the book of François Ponchot. Um, I am sure you have read the extensive criticisms that uh, Michael Vickery has on the use of interviews by Ponchot. Uh, in the period after 17 April 75. Can you tell us uh, if you have somehow incorporated this, these criticisms of uh, Vickery in your writings? Um, this is a, a realm of some 
irony um, because it's not not so much the well let me back up um, I think in general terms um, my experience has been that um, there's no fundamental problem um, in relying on what's sometimes deprecated as refugee testimony in attempting to ascertain the truth, to use the phrase that's the legal favorite in the court. Um, and indeed, it's certainly the case that if you look back on the sometimes somewhat sad history of understandings of Commit, uh, of, the, of democratic Cambodia when democratic Cambodia was in power and the stated public published positions of various the then tiny little group of scholars, academics who looked at Cambodia in that period. Um, the crucial moment, it seems to me, in their understanding of the regime and the moment at which most, if not all, came to what in retrospect seems to me to be the right conclusion about what was going on is the moment at which they began talking to large numbers of people uh, who had direct experience and upon whose accounts of those direct experience they relied. Um, so in general terms, um, uh, I think that's not a huge methodological problem. And then to return to the realm of irony, um, much of Michael Vickery's own work relies on testimony or interviews, if you prefer, that um, could be categorized as refugee interviews, and indeed many, in many instances interviews that were in fact conducted by me, uh, the results of which were uh, made available to Michael, um, and which Michael then interpreted uh, in some instances, at least many instances at the moment, back in those days, in a manner that um, was not the same as my interpretation of the data. That said, there's a kind of irony on top of the irony, uh, which is, in some ways, the conclusions that are stated in, uh, in among other places, re reassessing, um, resonate, echo what Michael has said about the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, the difference, again, is not, there's, there's a similarity in the extent of the emphasis on bottom-up initiative, bottom-up deviation, bottom-up abuse. Um, the major difference is my attempt to say this is characteristic of communist and other such regimes, and Michael's attempt, which resonates with Kiernan, to suggest this has nothing to do with communism, this has nothing to do with Marxism-Leninism, it's some kind of non-communist, anti-communist phenomenon. So again, the, the, in, in some senses, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Hedarian version, in the Vickery-esque version, much of the basic description is similar. The analytical conclusions, the expert opinion, if you will, um, derive from that data, the descriptive part, which is closer to what I understand a witness does, is in fact rather similar. And no coincidence, since, as I said, in many instances he's relying on stuff that came from me. I'm, I'm following, uh, following uh, your answer uh, well, I think, but just um, to be clear and, make, and, and give you a very concrete example in terms of um, percentages. In your reassessing article, you describe um, CPK documents, speeches, revolutionary flags, etc., in which the official policy is presented as, in the sense that 95% of uh, the people in the DK period were good, and 5%, the remaining 5% were, according to CPK official policy, no good, and were enemies or 
whatever you want to call it. Now, assuming for a moment, uh, just for clarity's sake, that is 95% and 5% were accurate. Um, how did you... What were your endeavors? How did you make sure that you were not only speaking to the people in these 5% or 10% or 15% uh, and not also to the remaining 95% of the people who uh, were not seen as In other words, how did you make sure that when you spoke to people you were in fact speaking to a selective uh, section of the DK period people? I'll try and count the objections on one hand. Firstly, making reference to supposed concrete examples without taking us to a page of reassessing. No document reference, no page reference, no footnote reference, no ERM. Secondly, referring to statistics which takes us inevitably into the realm of expert evidence. Thirdly, asking the witness to make assumptions about 75% and 5% being accurate. Fourthly, then asking the witness how the witness made sure that the person that they spoke to was in this group or not in that group or representative of this group or representative of that group. It's an absolutely jumbled question which in my respectful submission is going to expert opinion and one which cannot be unjumbled and cannot be made admissible. So I object to the question in its entirety on all those grounds. If I may reply, Mr. President, I've been trying to make things more clear by using percentages that the author has himself been using in a reassessing article. I have not say, I've not been saying that these percentages were somehow correct. My point was very simple. What did the, uh, the witness do when he was writing his articles? That he was in fact speaking to a, to a proper cross-section of the population in the DK period between 75 and 79. If he was only speaking to refugees in, at the Thai border, Thai border refugee camp, obviously this would give a completely different picture as to the living circumstances than if he would be speaking to, uh, to peasants who hadn't been fleeing the DK period. So that aside, 95 or 5, I think uh, uh, Mr. Head is perfectly capable, capable of understanding my question. It goes directly to the, the selective use or not of witness statements. So that is what it's all about. And uh, giving the background of Mr. Hedder, he perfectly understands what my question is.
ຕາອັງກິດເບຣສໍາຫຼັບໃບໃນໃບສໍາຫຼັບເລີສະຫຼັບຍິນຕົວຂອງສໍາຫຼັບມີຕະວີການ Oui, merci Monsieur le Président. Euh, tout d'abord, à titre liminaire, euh, la Chambre tient à faire observer à la Défense que tout au long de l'interrogatoire de témoins par euh, les procureurs ou par les avocats des partis civils, la Défense a demandé à ce que ce témoin soit traité comme un témoin. Or, euh, il nous semble qu'aujourd'hui, les questions qui sont posées quant à ce concernant la méthodologie utilisée par M. Steve Heder sont des questions qui concernent la méthodologie, non pas d'un témoin, mais d'un expert. Or, euh, notamment la question de savoir si euh, il a euh, sélectionné les, les témoins, comment il a conduit son travail, ce sont des questions qui, à l'évidence, sont des questions concernant un travail universitaire, un travail d'expert, et donc elles ne sont pas pertinentes dans le cadre de l'interrogatoire du témoin Steve donc, nous vous demandons de passer à euh, donc l'objection est reçue et les, euh, nous vous demandons de passer à un autre sujet. The prosecution has been asking many questions for two full days of all, uh, in respect of all the articles that this witness has written, asking about footnotes, about sources, etc. And now I'm asking about methodology, I'm not asking about an opinion of these articles that are cut off. And may I remind the Chamber uh, that I think the defense should be given a little more leeway than we have been given so far. We're questioning Mr. Heather, who I might call Mr. Khmer Rouge Tribunal. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. So I think I should get some more leeway in my question. So, um, But nevertheless, I move on, uh, Mr. President. Um, sadly, I uh, have some questions, Mr. Heather, about the use uh, in your articles of confessions. Um, would you be able to describe um, how you used those confessions Uh, in your articles. Uh, Mr. President, I object. I hope you remember on the first day of my question that I made it absolutely plain that no question I asked Mr. Heather would be about confession material. I said on day one that I was certain of it. In other words, that I was certain that no question I asked would be based on confession material. And I challenged the defence to intervene if I did. In two and a half days, I did not ask questions about confession material, and in two and a half days, the defense never suggested that I did so. Confession material has been rightly excluded from this case, generally speaking, unless it's, for example, an annotation on a confession or a letter accompanying a confession. This chamber is not going to be assisted by hearing answers from Mr. Heder about confession material. That material has been excluded, and given Judge Laverne's ruling, this is not an appropriate subject for Mr. Heder to comment upon. I have not touched upon confession material, and neither should the defence.
Unless it's for permissible reasons. Mr. Mr. President, there's a big difference between the question whether we can legally use the probative value reasons, confessions, in terms of evidence. I'm now asking the author of many articles and many books about his use of confessions and the way he has used confessions to come to whatever he has been writing in these books. But there's a big difference, a huge difference in the question whether you, as a court of law, can use it for probative value reasons or for reaching a judgment on the basis of that particular evidence, or to be used by this author of many books uh, of confessions. Apparently, this uh, witness, when writing his book, has used many, many, many confessions. Uh, and he came to uh, certain conclusions. Now, I'm not asking about his conclusions on the basis of these confessions. I'm, use, I'm asking uh, simply about the way he has been using uh, these confessions. Now, sadly, uh, uh, there is an article, a very interesting article, from the hand of Mr. Heather himself, which is not part of the case file. So, for very formalistic reasons, I, am not, I will not be allowed to use it. It's an article called the Khmer Rouge Opposition to Pol Pot pro-Vietnamese or pro-Chinese. Um, and it's a very interesting article from Mr. Heather about the way he is using confessions and about the danger they are, the dangers which exist uh, when interpreting the literal text and meaning of these confessions. Now, I think Mr. Heather is perfectly capable and perfectly um, allowed to give us his views on the methodology when it comes to confessions in respect of the publications that he has written. Take him to a passage. Take him to what he's written. Take him to his footnotes. Extract the footnotes and you're left with the admissible material in this case. You're not going to be helped by... Look at this passage. There were 16 confessions irrelevant. What's the point of you hearing from Mr. Header how 16 inadmissible confessions related to a footnote? I've extracted all the confessions for my examination and the defense should do the same. You're not going to be helped by hearing how inadmissible confessions were part of the writing of a book. I'm sure you can reply as well. Please, Mr. President, there's a difference in standard when treating the defense when it comes to this particular witness than the, the prosecution. We have all heard today this witness has written this book, Seven Candidates for Prosecution. He worked for the prosecution, he worked for the judges, the, the investigating judges, and now I'm trying simply to ask questions about the methodology used. Now, if I'm provided the exact same standard as the prosecution, that would be completely unfair. So it is appropriate and within the realm of the capacity of this witness to ask him about uh, his particular use of confessions. How did he deal with language? How did he deal with literal meanings? How did he deal with... Uh, when did he decide a confession was valid and could be used for his, for his research and his publications? That's a pr perfectly valid question. It's not a question about his opinion, just a question about how he uses uh, uh, confessions, how he uses interviews, how he uses uh, intelligence, how he uses newspapers, that is within the realm of this particular witness.
ແລະຕ້ອງຈະກ້ອງສະມັກລາໄວ້ໃຫ້ໄປເຈາະປີ Merci, Monsieur le Président. La Chambre considère que nous avons des questions qui sont posées aux témoins de Steve et de Il encore une fois pour la défense d'évaluer la qualité du travail d'experts. Or, le sème traitement doit être appliqué à toutes les parties. La même exigence qui a été réclamée par la défense de Munchia, à savoir que M. Steve Eder doit être traité comme un témoin et pas comme un expert, cette même exigence s'applique aussi à la défense de Munchia. Donc nous n'allons pas autoriser cette ligne de questionnement et nous vous demandons de passer à notre question. ແລະຄຸນລູກມີວິທີອຄຸນສະໄສແລະນີ້ດາໄປສໍາລັບໃຫ້ <coughs> នៅក្នុងវងពេលចុះសម្រាប់ថ្ងៃត្រង់ហើយនឹងឲ្យជើងគាត់ត្រឡប់មកកាន់កន្លែងផ្ដល់សេចក្តីកម្មនេះវិញ